Welcome back, wannabes and creators, to another episode of The Business of Art, the podcast that demystifies business for artists. And today on the show, I have Ben Bishop. Ben is a writer and artist who's responsible for The Aggregate, some of your favorite covers for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and the upcoming Drawing Blood book, which is on Kickstarter right now. Drawing Blood is co-written by David Avalon and Kevin Eastman, Yes, that Kevin Eastman of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles fame. The Kickstarter blew up recently, and I wanted to have Ben on the show to talk about it. Before we get to that show, though, I want to remind you that as of right now, this minute, you can sign up for our giveaway that's associated with my new book, Sell Your Soul, How to Build Your Creative Career. One person is going to win an awesome book marketing bundle curated by yours truly. It's really awesome. If, however, you check tomorrow, GoSellYourSoul.com will redirect to the first chapter of my book, Sell Your Soul, How to Build Your Creative Career, a 10-year data dump on everything I've learned to create, launch, and grow your business successfully. So either way, head on over to GoSellYourSoul.com and get some free things. and or twin some free things. Free! All right, that being said... Let's get on with the show. Take it away, Ben. Tell us what you're passionate about these days. Passionate about making comics. Same thing I've been passionate about since I was 11. Um, And for a long time, it's been my own comics. And recently, I'm getting to work with some talented people uh, on their comics and their stories and having kind of a hand in the creation of that process and character design and things like that um but yeah just just seeing how fast we can get get everything rolling uh the momentum of one idea becoming a comic and then becoming something else something else and then doing the next book and the next book so that's my long answer to say comics (laughs) yeah well i mean this but there's a lot of different things in comics like i am passionate about making comics but i'm also super passionate about like selling those comics afterwards so like everyone's got a different kind of like thing that they're passionate about immediately i love this story that is on your bio which is about you sending a letter to uh marvel and like that it that it, it really has been that long uh-huh. well it says you've been trying since you were four and you wanted to write uh that you wanted to do comics but like you've been pursuing it pretty much uh as a big passion since 11 is that accurate yeah so that must be my my bio and my last book, that aggregate, is that right? Uh, oh, it's on the one on your website. Is Ben wants to make comics oh, okay. since he was four and wrote to Marvel <laughs> at age eleven asking for a job. Okay, yeah, so that's accurate. I just had mentioned this to someone the other day, and uh, yeah, I've been drawing since I was like four. I used to draw dragons and make up my own characters and stuff because I was obsessed with any character-driven kind of series or comic or toy line. Um, and really, that nails it right there. Is I'm obsessed with these franchise is obsessed with like something that can go from a book to a toy line to also a cartoon that then sells that toy line and just the whole big picture of every single concept so when i was 11 i decided to make my own which is this comic called splash which was a blatant ripoff of fantastic four and uh it was only like four pages as well but after that i figured i was good enough and uh, like you said i wrote to marvel when I was 11 asking for a job because I was like, all right, let's, so that's the next step, right? We just got to get a job doing this. And, uh, they wrote me back and told me to basically grow up so that I was illegal enough to actually have a job. Mm-hmm. So they said, call us when you graduate high school and more importantly, keep sharpening your skills. And so I was like, cool. All I got to do is call them when I graduate high school. Um, uh, but it was obviously meant more than that. And it was, it was just, uh, kind of uh, another factor in the drive that said like you know this is possible and you can actually contact these people and you can show them your work and maybe they'll hire you um and so that's kind of where where that got me rolling in that direction and i uh just continued making my own stuff and people who've heard me before i've heard all this way too many times so sorry if it seems rehearsed but (laughs) tried to go to art school couldn't afford it after one year, so dropped out and decided to just do it myself. I said, if I want to make comics, maybe I should just make comics. So I spent the next four years making my very first book, 
the 300 page graphic novel called Nathan the Caveman. Um, so that's the four years I would have been in school and instead I was self publishing. And that, that led to this and then that and then that and then that and then things kind of snowballed from there. Um, you can really I, see the uh, the advancement of uh, of your whole style as you go from I'm looking at the Nathan the Caveman on the store right now. Mm-hmm. Then the difference between like you can see all of the elements that like you're going to use in the aggregate, That's but you funny. can definitely see the advancement. Everything that you do from the coloring to the inking to the to everything. Uh, in uh, if you look at Nathan, which is looks great, but then aggregate is like a different level. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was I was picking up um, in those four years on Nathan the Caveman. It was probably like the most like pivotal part of my process um, as far as like growing up and learning how to make comics. Like I drew the first half of that book, the first hundred and fifty pages, like sitting on my sitting on my couch and drawing on my lap and like completely ruining my back. And then I finally got a desk, and the second half of that book took. Uh, not even a fraction of the amount of time once I got a desk and then my desk also had a light box in it. So I was doing all my roughs on, you know, eight and a half by 11s and then light boxing them onto a new page, uh, which allowed the art to get a little bit cleaner and tighter. And you can see in the aggregate, like I'm, I'm pretty obsessed with things being clean and tight and really polished looking. Um, and so that's kind of where that whole process came from. And, and it, you're, people ask all the time, probably not just to me, but to other artists, like, how do you, how do you find your style? And, you know, I'm looking for my style and it's like, you don't find it. It literally finds you based on your process and tools you like and artists that you look at. Like I remember the first time someone said, I really like your style. And I was like, whoa, that's weird. I didn't know I had one yet. Um, but it's funny. You're picking up things of Nathan the caveman that are standing out, like things that I was doing then that you can see now. That's really cool to hear. Yeah, I mean, even just like so. There's like a main image on your site of the Nathan the Caveman, yeah. where the two people are holding hands, and there's like it look. There's three different panels as you start in the one, uh, and they're it's like they're uh, they are bust, and then the next mm-hmm. panel is just their like mid arm, and then the bottom one is their uh, as their uh, hands on, on uh, in black, and like yeah. that is something that I saw often. In, in the aggregate, which came through yeah. even, I don't know what page this was in the book, but like it shows what a hundred, at least 150 pages, which I have to assume mm-hmm. is at least a, a half a year before you started doing the aggregate. I mean, I uh, between then, but probably uh, between Nathan years, right? Caveman, between Nathan yeah. Caveman and the aggregate. Actually, it's a really long, really long time. Uh, this is the 10 year anniversary of Nathan the Caveman, uh, 2018. Wow. Yeah, so. Oh, I started that book when I was 18, uh, and uh, it's been a long time. So that's kind of – we'll jump around and talk about what the, the aggregate is and stuff later for those of you because we're jumping in like you already know. But uh, a long time had gone by. You can talk to them. What, like, what is the aggregate? Like, go for it. Like, whatever. We're having a free-ranging conversation. Uh, so Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. But I want to get back to – um, just how long it had been, because that was one of the main driving reasons that I did the aggregate is because I had done Nathan the Caveman. And then like I kind of glazed over a minute ago, it led to a lot of work. Like it led to freelance stuff, doing CDs, doing posters, doing whatever. Um, I got a job that I still have today. Uh, it's probably the longest job I've ever had doing uh, freelance illustration for an aviation magazine. And, and then commissions started to pick up and all this stuff. And so much time had gone by. And I just like stopped, uh, in around 20, 2015, I think. And I said, like, damn, I haven't made a book of my own in so long. Like, it's just not, it, I wasn't feeling like fulfilled or inspired. I've been doing all these samples for Marvel still. I got back in touch with them and have been sending them samples since 2011 at that point. And I was like, I'm done with this. Like, I got to do something of my own. And so I came up with the idea for the aggregate, which, uh, is, a uh, it's the very first split decision comic, which is a company that I've created and trademarked and all that jazz. And it's essentially like a choose your own adventure book, but in a comic form, which hadn't really been done. Um, there's a couple books out there like DC think that a Batman short, but it was digital where you had like two or three choices and, and you could bounce through the pages and in different directions. And then there was this other book called Meanwhile that did something similar, but it was more like, oh, what flavor of ice cream do you want? It was almost like a math experiment for the guy who uh, laid out this whole formula of 
you pick chocolate or vanilla and then you could go through a series of like 200 different choices but you followed tubes in the book like colored tubes and there were tabs on the sides of the pages and so mine was going to be the first time that it was done just very straightforward like a choose your own adventure book where you get to the bottom of the page and it says what do you want to do you want to kiss him do you want to push him away do you want to fight do you want to run um and then you just turn to the page um and what it led to was this book called the aggregate which is a it's like a post-apocalyptic story with giant robots and spider cats and the official log line is uh, a genetically engineered human super weapon must decide between his burgeoning humanity and a hardwired obligation to decimate the human race, dot, 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 and so must you. Um, so it's got four beginnings, seven endings, 20 choices in between, and the best part is you can reread it many different times in many different ways, and uh, that was really cool for me too because as an artist, you sit there and draw a page for 16 hours, and in comics, people... We'll look at that page for about 30 seconds and then move on. So it gave a lot of replayability to the art and the pages um, and the story. Well, and what's really cool about the book, uh, the, besides the fact that it's a split decision comic, was like um, that there is, when I have seen previous comics trying to do this, there is a leaning towards making really great art for one or two of the stories, maybe the two most popular. Mm. And then some of the pages just end up, you know, feeling not so amazing. But like this felt mm -hmm. like there was like every page was like as if they were every person was going to look at it like a hundred as opposed to other things i've seen kind of similar where like some of the paths that people didn't feel like didn't people didn't think were going to be the main path would like not have a as good a story in a book or not good as art in a comic book as well i really appreciated that oh good well i mean i was i'm, I'm like really hard on myself especially on the aggregate more than anything else i think and probably moving forward with drawing blood because there's so much pressure on such a high-profile job like this, but with the aggregate, there was tremendous pressure. Like, like I said, I hadn't done anything in a very long time, and I I did a Kickstarter and I was asking for ten thousand, which I got the first day, and then it went up to thirty thousand over the thirty days. And so I was like, "Look, cow, like, people really want this. Like this, there's like a lot of pressure now." And so when I was working on that book, I kept telling myself, "Like, this is my one chance to do a job exactly." how I want it and like right now at the best of my ability because uh, you can't always do that with a lot of jobs you have to cater the art uh, towards what the pay is a little bit um, and so I have a couple books in my past that I'm not completely proud of because they were I was just the artist on it and there was a different writer and the publisher didn't pay what it needed to pay and so I had to like kind of cram it into a certain timeline to make it worthwhile you can't you can't do your best work for for very low numbers and so on the aggregate i it's funny that you said what you said because i would i would be there and like literally thinking that to myself like no this isn't good enough do it again this isn't good enough um and luckily i found a, a place where i was nailing nailing it on a lot of days it wasn't like it was a it was a chore all the time to get my best work it was just like this is my best work today like it won't be my best work a year from now but we'll look back on it later so um I enjoyed the whole process a lot, even though it was grueling. <laughs> right. And I love yeah. this, the thing that you just said, which is like, it might, it's not going to be my best work in a year. I'm going to be able to do better yeah. work than this in a year, but like, this is the best that I can do right now. And I'm going to give it all right now. That's something that I find mm -hmm. with artists. They always oh. try and do better work than they are possibly capable of. And then like they mm -hmm. are very hard on themselves because like it doesn't reach the standard of what they think they're going to be in five years. Right. No, you got to, you got to draw the line eventually, but I, I, I can look at my stuff and know, like, go, oh, I didn't nail that, but I can. So let's try it again. Um, and that's a big part of my process too. Where I said, I used to work on, you know, various sheets of eight and a half by 11. And then I would, I would, once I found all the right, you know, sketches for every panel, I'd tape them together and put a new clean sheet over it and do the final on that. Um, I would do that because when you're working on separate sheets of paper and you're, you're racing and trying new things, it allows you to try it again. When you're working on one sheet of paper all the time, you're going to be like, oh, that's not great, but I've been wearing a hole in this paper with my eraser for, you know, two hours, so I should just leave that. 
Um, so now my process is I do all my refs digitally because it's essentially the same thing, except I'm not wasting <laughs> tons and tons of paper, but I'm trying new things. I'm like, no, I should erase that. Try it again, blow that up, spin it around, whatever. And then when it's ready, I print it out and I do my final on a real sheet of paper on the light box the same way I used to. Um, it's all about trying new stuff and pushing yourself. For sure. For sure. Was there a moment on uh, Nathan, the caveman where like you saw this massive like improvement in art from maybe like one page to another? Um, was there yeah. any moment that you can like look back on and where was that? Uh, well, because that book took so long, it took four years to make and, and that's like way too long. And the reason it took so long is because this Nathan the Caveman was my transition into um, being self-employed, quitting everything and just doing comics. So like the, the first half of that book, those 150 pages that I did on my lap took three years. And then when I got the desk, that next 150 only took one year. And that's also because at that midpoint is when I quit everything. I quit coffee shop jobs. I quit I was working at Portland Lobster Company and I quit that and I just like survived off coffee and toast. I saved up enough to know, you know, this is all I need for this amount of time to finish this book. And that um, I was lucky enough to, to jump out of the, you know, day job scene when I was young and I didn't have a lot of expenses. And so since then, I've been able to just kind of cater my expenses to the fact that no, I don't have another job. So this is how much I make with art. So this is how much my expenses have to be. Um, and that luckily that's gotten better and better as expenses have gotten worse and worse. Um, but as far as the art changing, it was around that same time. It was when I was able to dive in focus, you know, not be rushing to get stuff done before my three o'clock shift at the coffee shop. Um, and then the, the process changes as well. Um, you know, you, you do things a little differently once you get the desk and, and whatnot. Um, but going back to what we were talking about, about how you have to recognize that it's not your best work. Like you could always go back and change stuff. And I did, I went back to like page one and I was like, Oh my God. And I think I changed like two pages from the very beginning of the book, which at that point was like four years earlier. And I was just like, you know what? I could do this for the rest of my life. Like by the time I get back to the end, I'm going to go back to page one and go back to the end and then go back to page one. And I said, like, no, at some point you just have to call it and say, this book is done and I'll make a better book later. Um, and you're your own worst enemy, too. Like, people will still look at that book and think the art is like, tremendous. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> no. But I, I have the same matter. thing with uh, with with Katrina hates dead shit. Whereas my artist is, uh, is always like, can I go? I work for, I work at Marvel now. Like, can I go back and do issue one again? And I'm like, no, like that's the book. Like, it looks great. Like, I know, I, I, I understand you want to go back and redo it, but like nobody else recognizes that it's not amazing all the way throughout. And like, yeah. you are your own, like if he was doing this book, who knows if it ever would have come out because he would keep going and going and going, and redoing that book. And people do yeah. this with novels all the time, you know, like I remember when I wrote my first novel, I was like, I'm not a very good writer. What can I write? I can write probably a middle grade or younger book because like the sentence structure is not that difficult. And I can mm. write a short book because a long book I'm not going to be able to figure out. And then the next one, I was like, what can I do to make it a little bit more complicated? Well, I've been writing blogs for a long time. Maybe what if I wrote it all in blogs? And so like. Mm -hmm. I tried to cater the project to like the strength that I had at that time. I think that's smart. Yeah, it's a good good way to do. I mean, you don't have to do things the way other people do them just because that's how it's done. Like, <laughs> if that was the case, then we'd never have anything new. Uh, so I think that's a cool, cool concept. That's part of the reason why I excel at or, or enjoy Excel. Uh, I don't know why I think I can, I'm a good writer when it comes to comics, but maybe not, you know, sitting down and writing an actual novel. It's like, cause when I'm writing comics, I'm essentially writing like screenplays. It's all dialogue driven. And I say, okay, this is what he's saying. And then this is what's going to happen. This is what she's saying. And this is what's going to happen. Uh, so it's similar. It's, it's not, there's many different types of writing. Right. Well, and like uh, reading a comic book script is like pretty boring. Like, because it's like, here's this panel. It takes you out of it. It's like, here's a description of this panel, and then here's some dialogue. And then, like, you can't get into this dialogue because then there's a big thing right here with the next panel. So, like, most mm -hmm. of it comes out in the art, just like when you're reading a screenplay, it's a little bit 
more interesting to read, but it's mostly like directions on how to uh, ma- make this visual as opposed to like a novel where like, I remember the first time my friend who was a comic writer wrote his first novel and was like, I forgot I, I, it hit me after I sent it to the editor that like mm-hmm. nobody else is going to see this. Like all of the words <laughs> are like, this is everything. Everything's just going to be out there. And like, it mm-hmm. freaked him out. And then I was like, ah, you're just losing it. And then I, when, when I did my first novel, like it freaked me out. Cause I was like, Oh my God, they're going to see all these words. They've never seen all the words before. They've only seen like very few words with a lot of pictures. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. It's a cool, like I, I get really into process the same way. Um, like what we're talking about, like just people's different processes or processes that you find work or changing it up. Um, I do, I do things a lot differently than I did on uh, Nathan the Caveman now. As much as things have stayed the same, I do new things. Like I used to do, I would write that, I, I would write, when I was writing for myself, I would write like, I'd have the whole like outline, of course, and I'd have bullet points, and a lot of them were visual kind of staples. Like I know this wants to happen, and I know I want to see this happen, and I know this needs to happen. But as far as the script goes, I would only write like five pages at a time. And then I would draw those five pages. And, and when I drew them, I would do my rough on um, one, and then I would do my final all in one day. Um, so that each day I could feel like, oh, I did a whole page. Like I did good today. Let's, you know, congratulations to you. Um, and when I started doing the aggregate and, and kind of diving into that process, I turned that around so that I couldn't have any of that, um, that, satisfaction at the end of the day because that satisfaction means I might quit at four or I might quit at five. And so what I did with the aggregate is I just punished myself. I did all the writing straight through the entire book scripting. And then I did all, all uh, 160 roughs so that I never felt like, Oh, you did great today. You should take a break. You should watch TV. <laughs> and then I did the same thing with the finals. I did all my finals like straight through. So I was each step of the process like was its own thing. So I didn't really get any, you know, satisfaction, satisfaction until the whole thing was done. It was kind of grueling, but it was a great way to work because you just keep going. Instead of stopping after one page a day, you could you could potentially do like three that day. Um, that so that was fun, and that's how I'm punishing. Yeah, you don't feel you don't like like when you do a a rough to final, and then you're like, oh, it's six o'clock. This is great. Let's let's drink some beer and watch TV. Like you feel good. You feel good about that day. But that can be stalling too, because <laughs> if you did really good that day, you could have finished that like one or something, and then you'd just take the rest of the day off. So like, hell no, gotta keep working. <laughs> so it was weird. A normal it's day a, look like for you? Uh, uh, it changes depending on the project. But when I was elbows deep in the aggregate, it was uh, I was working from home, uh, so I had a studio upstairs in our house, and so I would wake up. I wake up early. I was raised on. Saturday morning cartoons and cereal and I would just like get up as early as I could to, to, you know, experience the day. So I still do. I get up at like six or so and then I would just go right to my studio room and I would just draw until I couldn't anymore. Usually I switch, I drink coffee all day until like two or three and then I switch to beer <laughs> and then I do that until I basically fall asleep. Um, when I was working at home a lot, my wife, Jill, would come home maybe around like six or six to eight or something. And then I would I would leave the studio and I would stop doing my comics and I would switch over to commissions. And I would do my commissions on the couch uh, like the good old days when I was drawing on my lap because I didn't need to be as precise and tight and clean. And I wasn't, you know, adhered to my desk as far as commissions go. Um, and so my days were usually comics and then my nights were commissions and things like that. But now I've got the outside studio, uh, outside of my house, that is. Um, and I just get here as early as I can, which usually ends up being like 7, 7.30. And I work until about 7, 7.30, 8 o'clock. Still switch to beer at 2. <laughs> and uh, just see, see how much I can get done. <laughs> You just, uh, you guys just uh, brought on my buddy uh, Dylan as one of your artists, right? Yeah, yeah, we're, uh, we call ourselves, we adopted the name um, that I 
had been branding and creating for the aggregate, the split decision comics. Um, but really what we're doing here, it's, it's me, Joe Schmalky, Ryan Wing, and Dylan Andrews. Um, and I needed an outside studio space. So I was like, we had just moved into a new place and, uh, the room that was going to be my room where I could set up was just like depressingly too small for what I needed. I have a ton of toys, ton of comics. I have like four desks and computer and tablet. And so I was looking for a space and I found a space that I could have afforded on my, on my own, but we had been talking about all getting together and, you know, image, uh, Dylan is obsessed with image. <laughs> I don't know if you can tell from his art, but he's like image 2.0, image 2.0. And so he was always talking about it. And Joe and I were always talking about, you know, having a space cause he knew he could get more work done outside of the house too. And so basically we decided to go in on this spot together. Um, even though some of them can't be here as often as they want to, but the split decision kind of label is right now, uh, it's not so much as like a publisher or a, or a comics house. It's kind of like just an umbrella for now. So that we can do different shows on the same weekend, for example, like we could be at four different conventions any given weekend if we wanted to and just booked under the split decision umbrella because you can't do that under like Ben Bishop, but you could do it under a name. Um, so we didn't really see any reason why our books shouldn't be available at all conventions every weekend. So we're working towards that as well as just having a central space to bounce ideas and drink beer. <laughs> right. I mean, one of my favorite so. parts of like seeing you at shows is like before every show. So going back to like keeping the cost down, it's like half of the like. <laughs> so I've seen you at uh, at Emerald City and Comic Con, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, like we live on literal opposite coast. But every time you're like, I don't have a table, so like who can give me some space? Like who can give me some yeah. space here and there and this other place? And like you have this very communal like friend art community, which. I find yeah. incredibly interesting because, like, I can't go be like, hey, who, where can I set up for two hours and bring, like, 300 books? Like, just you put yeah. it on your table. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, usually I'm, I've, I've been booked in the past, like, pretty well, um, but I'm terrible at keeping a calendar. Anyone who knows me knows that. And, and so sometimes this show will just, like, creep up, and I'm like, oh, man, why aren't I at that show? And because I'm self-employed, I can basically just be like, yeah, I'm going. And so a lot of times... I'll be very last minute and just be like, Hey, does, does anyone have a spot or you want to save some money? And so there's been a few times where I would just share a table. There's been other times where I would just go like Emerald city comic con was really nice to just be able to walk around. And that was like right before the aggregate came out. I think it was printing at the time. So what I did was I just like made a bunch of spiral bound copies at Kinko's that were super expensive just so I could like talk about it and give it out and, Robert Kirkman ended up taking one. And so like it was, it was time well spent, um, even though I wasn't making money at an actual table. And then same thing with San Diego. I got to go very last minute because Kevin Eastman brought me out for the drawing blood stuff. And then second I walked in the door to go find him at the heavy metal booth, the, his team Eastman guys and the heavy metal guys were like, Hey, sit down, start drawing. And so like suddenly I was tabling at the heavy metal booth at San Diego. And I was like, this is great. So, Things have a way of working out. Um, I prefer that over, you know, over like buying a table at some crappy small show and then being stuck to it all weekend. Well, it's fun. It's like uh, where's it's it's like where's Ben when at the show? It's like yeah. oh, you're here now. Like it's like oh look, there's the place. Like I remember you were looking for a place and then I got really busy at my table and was like look, you found a place for like even I don't know how long you've been here, but like it was pretty cool. Like I was, I was like talking to you at San Diego. And then, like, someone was standing next to me, and, like, I, he, we, like, bought a book. Like, he bought a book from me, and then I turned around and was like, all right, cool. Now I have the money to buy this book from you like, <laughs> yeah, right that was there like, at the show. Yeah, I talked to that guy. I was like, was this your money? He's like, yeah. I was like, oh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> so that's was the way funny. it should go. Um, there's something I want to talk about on your website also. Cool. While we're, while we're talking, while, while, while we're moving back and forth randomly between stuff, it's like, I I went to this this uh, one of the links is for the Bishart Kids Club. Yeah, and I was like, what the hell is that? Like, is this like for kids or like was like what is this? And like, it's fucking incredible. Like, I love the name. So it's kind of like, a, can you talk a little bit about it? Because yeah. I love the names of each tier. Yeah. So uh, I'm not looking at it right now, but I'll tell you the premise, and then you can read off the names of the tiers for me. Um, so the idea was uh, Kevin Eastman's been very successful with 
obviously everything in his life, but he has a, uh, he has a fan club and they had a turtle fan club when I was a kid too. And it was always something that I was a part of. And, and, and I was just thinking, I was like, there's all these avenues out there, obviously like we're crushing it on Kickstarter. It's like the best thing to happen to comics ever. Um, and then there's Patreon, which a lot of people do. And I actually had one before I decided to jump ship and do Kickstarter, which is a different conversation, but Patreon didn't allow me to set up what I wanted to set up, which was this kind of fan club. Um, but I called it the Bishart Kids Club, um, kind of as a nod to the BK Kids Club from when I was a kid. And uh, basically what it is, is it's, it's similar to a Patreon, whereas you have like a monthly amount that you contribute, which will help me make comics and do all this stuff. But I really drilled down what you get from that. Um, and so there's four different tiers. What are the four different tiers? So for five dollars, you can be a little bish. Yeah. <laughs> for ten dollars, you can be a basic bish. Yep. <laughs> Twenty dollars, you can be a mega bish, and fifty dollars, you can be a wicked bish. Yeah. And so. And all of them come with a little card. Yeah. So I made. Right? Uh, yeah, I made up these like basically convention badges um, that you know you can join at a show when you see me, or you can get one in the mail when you um, sign up online. But you get like a membership card that you can wear to shows and stuff like that. And so each of those tiers come with different things. Obviously, the the lowest one doesn't come with as much as the biggest one. But for like the top tier, for example, the $50 one, you could essentially get a Bish box like every month, which comes with a random assortment of, of cool things that I have. Uh, the first ones I did, um, I sent out one of the one of the two aggregate variants, which is a $40 value in and of itself, but it also came with like, like six of the variant covers I've done for turtles and revolution and, and things like that. So it was just this big pile of stuff. And it also comes with weird, funny stuff that you can only get here in Maine, like a, a menu to the wing place. I go every single week, like just, just like a weird little relic that you get. Um, and then I do live prints. And so the live prints are like printed line work that you can, that I then add like watercolor tones to and I draw in the background. And so I have like four turtles that I do. And so the first fish box came with Raph, the next one will come with Leo, so on, so on. So it's this ongoing thing. And like I said, similar to Patreon is in that it's a, a monthly thing, but it's different because, um, I didn't want to confuse like the online world when i go to do aggregate book two on kickstarter and they're like well you already have a, a patreon going why do you need to do a kickstarter too and so like i like to keep i like to keep things focused because a lot of people don't understand patreon yet um and how good it can be for people who are you know blogging or doing podcasts or even drawing um but for this i kind of want it to be a separate thing you know so yeah i've Absolutely. I mean, I'm I'm trying to figure out how to do a fan club and like membership stuff, like Patreon or my own stuff now, uh -huh. because I've been in the same boat as you're talking about. We're like, I do starters, and but like, I mean, let's be fair here. A Kickstarter is great. You get a massive amount of money at once, but then it's a nightmare for a long time because it's very hard to like launch new products while that Kickstarter is being in development. Like while you are, while you are like that. So we made. $27,000 on the Monster Anthology Kickstarter yeah. and that money came in in April. We printed the we went to print almost immediately. Those prints still haven't come. Yeah. And so like you, how, how do you launch a new book while like that and like if your business is launching books, that $27,000 has to last you until like you somehow fulfill this Kickstarter and then you can go back. And like how do you like so the difference between like having that massive launch and those monthly sort of checks is uh, uh, like sort of the tightrope that I'm trying to figure out right now myself. Yeah. Yeah. I don't envy writers because, I mean, you're in a position where the good thing is you can do multiple projects at once. But the bad thing is like the whole scenario you just gave, like you're not going to launch another Kickstarter before you deliver your last one. Like that's just bad form. And so, yeah, it's tough. Uh and Patreon kind of has an answer to that, but then at the same time, a lot of people don't understand what it is. They're like, "Wait, I'm paying your like electric bill because I'm giving." They they assume if they're giving you money every month, it's like another bill to them, but they don't realize like your Kickstarter is paying my electric bill too. Like like 
<laughs> like it's paying for everything. Right. Like it's paying for me to survive to make this product. Um, you know, I'm not making any money on it. Trust me, I'm going to put in way more effort than I should have. <laughs> and, and it's going to take me longer than I thought it would. Um, but that's so we can have the best book possible. And then maybe I'll make something consistent once the book is out. Like, I, I guess that's the trick. Um, and that's what you've got to do if you're not doing it already, which I'm sure you are, is now that the book is out or whether it's the last book or whatever, that's got to be the frequent, you know, in income that then funds you to get ready to do another Kickstarter. You know, the sales, right. the sales of that book have to be your Patreon essentially. Absolutely. I mean, that's what ends up happening. Yeah. It's like we have two books on the table and then eventually when this book is released, we have three books on a table, but it still becomes this, you still have to be like, with comics. It's very tough to do online sales. It's very easy to do in-person sales, which flips when it comes to novels mm -hmm. um, because people in comics like buying stuff at shows, which means if you're making your money on the books that are on a table, you physically have to be at that table or like you're talking about having multiple people at multiple tables all selling multiple things. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I've, so I've had a lot of – What would you say some... – No, you go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say – I, had... I wanted to say like <laughs> – you. All right. I'm going to shut up. Oh, sorry. Uh, but don't forget what you're going to say because I'm interested. Uh, I was just going to say I've had I've had good success online um, because I'm like I'm very active on Instagram and stuff as I'm sure you've seen. Um, so so a lot of new people are finding my stuff, which is nice. Um, but I've also had good success when I'm at the show selling the books. Like I've just been very lucky that you know the book was the aggregate was as cool as I knew or thought it was going to be like people are people are really into it um and so yeah it's hard to find new people for the online thing but it, it's all a means to an end it's like you, you keep pumping that instagram keep pumping that twitter whatever it is and you'll find new people who are like why haven't i heard about this yet like or why don't i have this yet and so it all it all works but. yeah i mean and like i'm i'm also very active online but most of it is, most of it still drives sales at shows so like gotcha. a lot of people will find us online and then eventually they'll buy at shows or they'll buy, they'll find us at a show and then they'll like either buy the next kickstarter so like i mean i guess it's not really fair to say that we're really bad at online sales because like a kickstarter is technically online i mean that's it's not in-person sales, and in the world of binary, like you're, it's not if it's not an in-person sale, and they're mm -hmm. buying it online. Then Kickstarter is by definition an online mm -hmm. yeah. thousands of dollars in a Kickstarter. Like, you know, you're doing okay in online sales. Like, we right. had a sales goal at the beginning of this year to do two grand a month on online sales, and we did a Kickstarter for twenty-seven thousand dollars. And I was like. <laughs> Well, that's not really what I meant. Like, I didn't really mean to do twenty-seven thousand dollars, but I guess technically we have done, we have hit our revenue goal in online sales mm -hmm. during this campaign. Yeah. Um, but I guess, like, what could you give us a little bit of like your best tips for like do having this consistent revenue from a fan club or a Patreon or something like that, so you can have that consistent revenue between your launches. Hmm. Between launches, uh, I don't know. What I did personally was it, it was all kind of like a snowball effect because I did the Kickstarter. I had a I had a certain amount of a fan base. Um, I was just getting into doing the turtle stuff, um, and so I mean, turtle fans are crazy. So that's my first piece of advice: is if you're an artist, do some turtle artwork because they'll love you forever. Um, but so what I ended up doing, like I had it stuck in my head for the longest time that I couldn't, I couldn't just sit down and make a book unless a publisher said they wanted it. And so I was doing like a five page pitch here or five page pitch there on a different book. I'd actually pitched the aggregate to a bunch of publishers and got rejected. And, and I thought, you know, like there's no way to afford sitting down at a desk for 16 hours a day and doing a book without that. And so then obviously I started doing research on Kickstarter and it worked out. And then as I was making that book, um, like I think you touched on that money is spoken for, obviously. And like I touched on the project 
is bigger than you anticipated and it's more expensive. And so things were taking longer. And so I said, like, I can't touch this money anymore. Like, otherwise it'll be gone when it comes time to print. And so I just like shut that account off, which was originally supposed to fund the creation of the book as well as the printing. Um, and so what I found out though, was that because of that fan base that I had and because that fan base got bigger from doing the Kickstarter, I was able to kind of, I mean, this is, this applies more to, artists than it does to writers, but I was able to um, get a lot of commissions. And those commissions that I would switch over to the couch in the evenings would fund my whole week, um, my whole week of making comics. So so whereas the Kickstarter did like change my life and, and show me like, oh, people want to make a book or people want you to make a book and you can do this on your own without a publisher, at the same time, it found a way to show me that I probably could make a book, at least the process behind it possibly a good chunk of it without Kickstarter, you know, get a really good head start on it and then launch a project. So that was pretty nice to know um, that just the the growing of your fan base, like can support you if you designate a certain amount of time to, you know, freelance and commissions and then the other amount of time to passion project book I want to do in the future. Um, I really like, I like I'm, I'm, I'm looking at publishers and stuff and, and I like what a lot of them are doing, but, at this point, it's like, why would I give you anything? Like, I'm not going to give you any rights, you know, unless you're going to get me a movie deal. Like, all I'm looking for is where you're placed in previews magazine and do you want to pay for printing, you know? Like, it's like Kickstarter has proven we can just do it ourselves. All you need is distribution and printing. That's where I'm at. Yeah. This is a great segue. You just segued perfectly into talking about the Kickstarter you guys are running now. I didn't even have to do anything. Yeah. Uh, I totally agree. I mean, the thing that I love about Kickstarter is that, like, it em- emboldens you to be like, I, people want this thing. Like, I can make this thing. And, like, more than the money, don't get me wrong, the money is great. But the fact that you can say, hey, 100, 200, 300 at our last project. 600 people wanted this book. Mm-hmm. That kind of objectively means it's good. Like, yeah. at least the 600 people. So, like, not only do I get the money, but I get this sort of sense of, like, oh. Yeah. Like, I'm not crazy. People do want it. No, yeah, that really, like, emotionally affected me the, well, the first day when my Kickstarter hit the goal <laughs> in one day. I was like, holy crap. Like you, you have your first thought is like, like, wow, thank you. Like, this is amazing. Like these people, like, it's not just me who cares about making my own stuff. Like there's people out there who care about you making your own stuff. And, um, yeah, that was really, it was insanely touching. Like it was nuts. Um, I can't really explain it. And then on top of that, it was just like, okay, like now I owe it to them to make something awesome. You know, <laughs> it was cool. Right. All right. So, so that one felt good. Yeah. Now I got to ask you another question about feelings. Yeah. How did it feel when your current project eclipsed the entire thirty-day run of your book in like twenty-four hours? That was nuts. Like, uh, I want to say, like, oh, I knew it would be insane, and I knew it would go well. So, what we're talking about to fresh ears is uh, not too long ago, literally a couple. Weeks ago, I got contacted by Kevin Eastman, the co-creator of the Ninja Turtles, to draw a book for him and co-creator, co-writer, uh, David Avalone. And it's called Drawing Blood, and it's the story behind the stories, and it's loosely based on, you know, uh, uh, Kevin's life and any other creator's life who've gone through crazy hijinks and creating a multi-million dollar, billion dollar franchise at a very young age and and then what happens to a comic creator then and kind of getting back to their roots and, and remembering why they got into this comic creation business in the first place. So anyway, uh, we launched Kickstarter on August 1st. And as you said, um, it got over 30,000 in the first 24 hours. And yeah, feelings, um, that felt awesome. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not a hundred percent, you know, my project like the aggregate was, but in a lot of ways, um, I am a big part of this project. Like it's, it's all three of ours, which is really nice. Um, and we're, we're really a collaborative team as far as ideas go. 
And they kind of gave me the keys to this Kickstarter and said like, Hey, you're the only one who's done this before. And I built the page. Um, you know, obviously they created the rewards as well, but all the visuals you see on the page, I just woke up early one morning and did it. And I said, what do you think? And they loved it. And I think it's had a huge, uh, in addition to Kevin's rabid fan base and massive fan base, I think it had a huge effect on how well the Kickstarter did, um, and is doing. It's got, 24 days left out of 30 and it's already at 41,782 with almost 600 backers. So yeah, that felt insane. Um, and it's really nice. I, I I'm promoting it just as much as I would, um, the aggregate because it's like, we got to make this goal. Otherwise I don't get to do this dream job. You know, I don't get to draw a book for the guy who created Ninja Turtles. Um, so we're, we're racing towards it and I think, I think we'll hit it. I obviously would love to hit it sooner than later because then everyone who's been waiting goes, Oh, well the book is actually happening now. I guess I'll throw my money. Uh, I wish, just wish they'd do that now (laughs) because then we would get there. But, uh, yeah, it's been insane. Yeah. I remember when you were, when when you were, uh, like worried a couple of days before what was (laughs) going to happen. And, uh, you've got about, about $6,000, and just like, like two or three days, maybe four days at this pace, you're going to pass every dollar that I've raised on Kickstarter in like 200 days in yeah. like 10, which is like, it's crazy. That's like crazy. That's like almost a year of campaigning to watch something like, uh, like enjoyably. Cause I know David, I know you and I'm like, wow, like two people that I know just like hit this thing that like, I spent a, almost a year of my life like doggedly campaigning for mm-hmm. like in like a week, yeah. a week and a half. And that is like, inc- that's incredible. And a feeling I remember the day that my, that my, the monster anthology made more than I had ever made in combined in all of the Kickstarters that I had done in like tw- 20 days. Yeah. And I was like, Oh my God. Like it was like, I did this, mm-hmm. but I also am watching this as if like, as like an, a, an outside spectator, because like, I don't understand what's happening, <laughs> but like, I also know that I am responsible for it happening as well. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty amazing you when have... it's a hundred percent your project and I'm sure, uh, Kevin is, is feeling it. I remember talking to him the first day when we had that just insane day. And, and honestly, he, I, talking to him privately before before we launched he was still like he wasn't being modest he was like yeah well i really hope you know it works he didn't know either and i remember talking to him the first day uh to he and his wife courtney and they put me on speakerphone because he was lying on the floor <laughs> he, was, he was just like on his back on the floor like what a day like it was crazy so i'm sure he felt the love and it's, it's just such a weird, like, it's so hard to explain until you do it when you get, like, this mass of people that's like, yes, I want to see your friggin' book. Especially after, you know, trying to pitch it other places or, you know, pitch it on a synopsis, which isn't the best way to go. But, like, trying to get it made elsewhere and everyone saying no or, oh, you're not ready and, and things like that. And then you just do it. And it's like, yeah, I guess it was. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, on top of this, like, I remember when I did the first one, when I did Ichabod, and I was like, People, I had pitched it around everywhere, and they were like, no, it's too weird. It's like horror. Nobody wants it. And I was like, that's weird because I want it, and like yeah. all of my friends want it, and most of the people I talk to want it. So like, there's people – like I, I'm not saying I know everyone in the world, but like there's at least a few hundred people that want this thing, which is like more than you normally sell of a graphic novel. Mm-hmm. And then you do like, but you, and then you like, you're like, okay, I'm just going to do it because like these people are wrong. They're wrong. They're, I know they're wrong. But you're still like, I hope they're wrong. I hope they're yeah. wrong. And like, no matter how much you're like, all right, I'm going to hit this launch button and I'm going to hope that I'm, that they're as wrong as I think they are. Yeah. Yeah. You, you really don't know for sure. You, all you can do is be confident in your own thing. And, and a lot of that plays into the Kickstarter too. Like people want to see your confidence as far as advice for other people listening. It's like, you have to be the most confident in it because people are putting everything on you. So you have to be like, this is happening. Do you want one early? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like this is happening no matter what. I'm going to find a way to make this book. Do you want to be a part of it? Um, 
it's fun. Yeah, it's it's nerve wracking and fun and like like you said, I put that last campaign together and I was like, it was more money than I'd ever asked for. Like I asked, I was asking for sixteen thousand dollars, which doesn't seem like that much in retrospect, but to me, I, it was like the most that ever raised at that point in any one project was seven, mm-hmm. or no, sorry, eight. And so I was asking for like more than double, almost, a little less than double of what I had ever asked for before. And I was like, even though I had 50 creators on board, mm-hmm. I was like, this is a lot of money. This is a lot more money than like, what if I fail? What if I do that? And you guys are going for like 75 grand, which is yeah, not that 15 grand is chump change, but 75 grand. It's like, that's the average salary of two humans in America for one year. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't picture that amount of money. <laughs> uh, and I've seen the budget and it's all legit. And I know that some, we've had a couple questions from people like someone just the other day was like, I read through this project many times. And after careful study, I just can't understand why you need 75,000 for a 22 page book. <laughs> and, and then I was like, uh, in your careful study, did you notice that it's not a 22 page book? It's a like 180 something page graphic novel. <laughs> like, so, okay. <laughs> um, but the other thing is like, you know, it's all in and up until now, it's all, it's been like Kevin's thing, you know? And so, so he's been, it's Kevin Eastman Studios is essentially the publisher of this thing. And there's a lot of people that are being hired for this book, uh, without getting into details, like me, David, the colorist, Brittany Peer, we've got Taylor Esposito doing the, the lettering. And then there's also printing on top of that. And then there's Kevin's crew who's helping you know, make this Kickstarter happen and running social media and stuff like so. So like those numbers are real and this is what it costs. And anyone who's published a book, knows it's more expensive than you could ever imagine like you're always wrong you know like there's always some part of it that you underestimate and and it's all it's all real it's a lot of money and uh, at one point we weren't we were talking about doing issues uh, and we had a much lower starting goal we were looking at something more like what i did which was 10 grand and that would have been insane because we'd be like 400 percent funded uh by now and, and we'd be you know number one on the kickstarter page and stuff which which was enticing to you know set a lower goal and and then totally kick ass but you know this is the real this is what you need and if you're gonna another piece of advice is if you're gonna do a kickstarter don't don't ask for less than what you need because if you get that money you're screwed Uh, yeah i i remember the first time so the first time i ever had done a campaign was on on indiegogo (laughs) and i was like oh i get to keep all this money so we set the goal at like 8500 and I was going to do the book anyway, and I got like 1500 and I remember freaking out mm-hmm. and being like, oh, my God, thank God I was going to do this book anyway, because like, what if I what if I had fifteen hundred dollars? Like, what if I had fifteen hundred dollars and I had to make an eighty five hundred dollar book? Yeah. Like what what would I do? Like, I don't know. Like, I don't know what I would do if I just took fifteen hundred dollars from people and mm-hmm. like. There's no way I could deliver. Yeah, that's why I don't like Indiegogo for this type of thing at all or GoFundMe or any of those. They're not made for this is because it goes back to the confidence thing. By going to Kickstarter and knowing that it's an all or nothing goal, you're immediately telling the audience how much uh, commitment and faith and confidence you have in the project right now. Like you're saying like, no, this is exactly what we need to make this happen. And I know it will get there, which is why I'm on Kickstarter and not on one of those guys. Um, because you know what you need. And if you get less than that, like you just said, you're screwed. <laughs> it's not enough. Right. I mean, I, I, I have this process where like I self fund the whole book mm-hmm. to the end. So like we are almost done with our new graphic novel and like it costs me, it will cost me somewhere around the realm of $16,000 by the time it's all said and done before I ever bring it anywhere to sell it or kickstart it or anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And like, I think you do need to have that like skin in the game where you're like, Hey, like, this is what I need. If, if I get this money, then I will have a project. If I do not get this money, then who knows what happens, which is one reason it feels like such a betrayal when the project doesn't happen Mm -hmm. because you're like, 
wait, 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 wait. You said you needed two thousand dollars to make this. Oh, you mean when I when something you, have two th- you mean when something funds and then they they just bail and don't make it? Right. Yeah. Like why would why would you tell me that this is what you needed if you really needed something else? Yeah. Yeah, I've never I've never backed one that that didn't go through luckily, so I haven't experienced it firsthand. But I know some people who have, and it's just like, man, I would not risk that. Like, uh, the last thing I would ever want to do is risk my, you know, reputation online or as a creator that I don't follow through on stuff. Like, I've got some projects in the past that are taking a hell of a lot longer than I ever anticipated they would, and they're still out there and they're still happening. They're not done, but I'll never just turn my back on it. It's insane. Like you just ruined your, yes. your entire, your, your entire, like you can never do a Kickstarter again. Like what? <laughs> Crazy. Right. Yeah. Like we had, uh, our, 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 our printer had a misprint on the cover where like it was perfect except that the eyes of the cover mm-hmm. of our, it was supposed to be yellow. There's a bunch of eyes, it's a bunch of monsters on the cover of our new book and it's got all eyes and they're all supposed to be yellow. But uh, they just didn't print the yellow layer, so they were all white. And I remember, like, so this book is 99.9999999% perfect, except for the white eyes on the cover. And I remember pitching a fit for, like, an hour, sending email after email after email, because, like, that – I was freaked out about about – not having that one thing perfect, let alone the fact that the rest of the book was like I had had to do like four different proofs of it. And I had pro- I'd overall had like 10 different proofs of this book to make sure that it was right. Like that one thing sent me back to like the mattresses and delayed us for a month because that one, that had to be perfect because I've released 11 books. And mm-hmm. like you're damn right. Like I owe it. I, I want to release a 12th. That first, that 11th book is as important to get right as the first 10. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you got to just, you have to set a, a standard of excellence. <laughs> you can't you can't put out bad stuff. It needs to be what you want it uh, to. You only get one shot to make it exactly how you want it. Right, and that's like, that's one of the freakiest, to me, that's one of the freakiest things about being a writer or an artist is like, You've done it right 10 times, but the 11th time, like the pressure is as I I feel the pressure of that. Like it's even worse the next time because like it's the pressure of like more people Uh like being in the audience so that they're it's like all the weighted pressure of wanting to do a great project and of all the other people who have bought it and liked it. And then more people who have bought in like just the last one, Uh like pushing you down each time. And you're better, like you're more likely to put out a great project again and again and again once you've already done one. But I don't know, not to bring it, not to bring it down to a depressing level, but I always feel like I always feel like a ton, like a ton of weight every time I start a new project that it is as good or better as the last one. Oh no, that's a huge, that's a normal, normal thing. I remember even when I was really young and I finished Nathan the Gave Me, I'm one of my good friends, and it was just like, all right, now. You're going to have to talk to us. And I was like, oh, crap. And, like, he didn't know that it would have such a weight on me after he said that, but I thought about it every day. And uh, you do, to an extent, at least make it as good. Don't let it suck. Um, but as far as the campaigns go, like, you think about that, too. Like, I know I've been thinking a lot about when I go to do Aggregate Book 2 on Kickstarter, which I'm planning to do hopefully in March, um, depending on where Drawing Blood is at. Um, but think about it and i'm lucky i have this like in between drawing blood campaign because it's not 100 percent my campaign like i said um it's doing great but it's it feel i feel like a lot less pressure than i'm sure kevin does um or david but it's it's a nice little in betweener for when i have to go back to back to the kickstarter and, and do it all myself for aggregate book two because you're scared you're like all right, well, it worked last time. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work this time. You hope that everyone who got it wants to get the next one, but you also don't know. And you also know that you may have not asked for enough last time, and that's why the book took longer than it should have, and you had to take a lot more commissions and things like that. And so you're going to ask for more this time, but how much more? If I'm asking for more, are they going to be turned off because they're not going to know the inner workings and think that, you know, I'm just asking for more because I ended up getting more last time? Like, so there's like a lot of, a lot of inner turmoil that goes through your mind 
until you just hit the launch and see what happens. Right. Yeah. And like, it, it is like having a business and being a business person is so hard all the times. Yeah. All the time. Like that's what every, t- every conversation I have always ends with like, it's fucking it's just hard. It's like, it's all bad. It's all hard. It's not all bad, but it's all like, I don't find it to be complicated. Like, Put out good book, do it again, do it again, do it again. Let the audience tell you what they want and then do that thing. And then they'll keep growing and you'll keep making more things. Mm -hmm. But it is like crushingly hard at almost every moment, except for that moment where you're like, oh, I launched this project. And right now it's like a good day, which is what I like. Mm -hmm. Like uh, when I do a con and I'm like, oh, I made way more than I thought today. Today was a good day day Mm -hmm. yeah you Ah. get that satisfaction of knowing again people want what you're what you're doing and it was all worth it all right so i could keep talking about this for hours but Mm -hmm. i have a bunch of stuff to do today i know you do as well so um i'm going here's the chance where you get to you're going to get a couple of chances to do things here right now is the chance uh for you to pitch drawing blood why should people in my audience go and back it okay well drawing blood is really cool like i said because it is kind of the ins- inside look of uh we, we called it like tales from the con for a while kind of thing but it's there's not a lot of books out there about about there's a lot of books about writers and like you know stephen king writes about writers all the time but this is this is about comic people and, you know, it follows somebody who, who found the success at a very young age, like Kevin did. And instead of Ninja Turtles, it's the radically rearranged Ronin ragdolls. So if you like Ninja Turtles, you're going to like the ragdolls, samurai cats and things like that. But the similarities, um, kind of stop there. And it's just this compilation of stories he's heard or he's experienced or David's heard or David's experienced. And, and some of the stuff even I've experienced in the, in the new days as, as the youngster of, the comic con um, crowd or the creator owned crowd um, in dealing with cosplayers and, you know, table costs and convention hijinks and things like that. So there's all that, but then there's this like, there's like this action to the story as you've seen in the first uh, kind of pages we've released where like people who think it's based on Kevin, Kevin's like, no, I've never been in a, in a gunfight with Lithuanian gangsters. Like, so there's a lot more to the story too, than just the surface level. Oh, this is a way for, for Kevin to tell his story in a, in a strange way. Um, it's really cool. It's a, you're going to get a lot of insight into the realities, um, of what it's like, but at the same time, a lot of the, I keep saying hijinks, but a lot of the action and adventure that, that could happen in this fictional world, um, based around a comic book creator and his properties kind of growing legs without him. Um, it's just a lot of fun and it's forcing me to draw gunfights and car chases and cityscapes like you wouldn't believe. The aggregate was a lot of fun because I just got to do whatever I wanted, which was basically deserts <laughs> and a little bit of, yeah. a little bit of jungle. But this one is like, nope, vacation's over. You got to draw this type of gun and this type of car. And, it's good. It's going to definitely challenge me and it's going to make my next book even better because of that. Um, yeah, I'm not, and I really want the first stretch goal, which is to get the first issue of the, uh, yeah. of the uh, radically rearranged Ronin rag dolls. Do you have a number that you need to hit? Yeah. I couldn't find it anywhere to hit that. What is the number that you need to hit to get that? Uh, I thought, extra issue? I thought we had that listed. Maybe it was an oversight, but, uh, so the main goal is 75,000. And then you're going to get volume one of this graphic novel, which is essentially the first four issues that we were planning to do in issue form. Um, and then if we go to a hundred thousand, which I think as soon as we hit our goal, things will start rolling like every Kickstarter does. Um, if we get to a hundred thousand, Kevin's going to do the layouts for, um, we call it the recreation of the radically rearranged Ronin Ragdolls issue one, which is our, our character inside Drawing Blood is named Shane Bookman, and he created these characters, kind of like his Ninja Turtles. Um, and this is going to be a recreation of Shane's initial issue one, which will be laid out by Kevin and then drawn by Troy Little, who uh, has an awesome, awesome animated type style. And he did the Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas book for IDW, and, and we're going to make the cover all vintage, and it's going to really feel like a, 
a relic from Shane Bookman's past. Um, so I'm really excited about is it that. Is it going to feel like those original? Is it going to feel like those original Turtles books? Maybe, maybe we've got some definite, definitely cool ideas um, as far as printing it to make it literally physically feel like something from the past. Um, it's going to be cool, and we have we have other ideas too that we get on the phone, the three of us, me, David, and Kevin, and, and we're like, well, what if we hit? this number we could do this we could do six extra pages of blah 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 blah. like i can't tell you yet but but there's some stuff that's even cooler than the rag dolls that we have potential plans for if we can just um get past that goal um i hope you get all of the money all of the uh, money there are four <laughs> all of it and there are uh four different covers uh, no, sorry, two different covers yep. but four different options right there's the signed uh ben bishop cover mm-hmm. And the regular cover, and then the uh, signed Kevin Eastman cover, and the regular uh, and the regular uh, Kevin Eastman cover. Right. And the Kevin Eastman cover, uh, assuming this is, I don't know if this is going to be the final artwork, but it looks very original Turtles esque from what I'm seeing on the web page. It says not actual cover artwork, right? But it, I, I hope it is very much in the original Turtles spirit of the artwork. Yeah, the the, the little mock up I made there is. It's pretty cool, and actually, a few people have been hoping that was the actual artwork, but it's not. Kevin is—he's redrawing um, a couple ideas for for his actual cover um, that I've seen, been lucky enough to see the layouts for. Um, the mock-up on the page is his piece that he drew for the Rag Dolls um, on our San Diego exclusive poster, um, where they are very, you know, cross-hatchy, and it feels like the old original turtle art which is very cool especially as we haven't really revealed the rag dolls yet like that's one thing that's not on the page yet which is another thing that will slowly get unveiled as we get closer to or past our goal um we're gonna probably reveal the rag dolls individually as things move um but i think that's like that's what caught me when he talked to me on the phone too was like just picturing just this because it's essentially another <laughs> another like Ninja Turtle type thing from Kevin Eastman. So I was like, oh, I'm really excited to see those ragdolls, you know? <laughs> and then I found out right. I wouldn't be drawing most of the ragdoll scenes. And I was like, oh, okay. Uh, Cause in the book, Kevin will be doing flashbacks in his, you know, classic Kevin Eastman style. Um, and then Troy Little will be doing, um, there's scenes in the book where like he's taunted by these creations that he doesn't own anymore. And the ragdolls come to life and push him around and, you know, and, and talk to him. And, and so Troy will kind of transition, we'll, we'll all transition the art right into Troy's, um, where the characters will come alive and kind of kick Shane around or put him back on his, uh, on his path and things like that. And so those are going to be really cool scenes. The ragdolls I get to draw are the ones that are going to exist within the real world. Like when Shane's at a comic convention and there's cosplayers and, and there's old books in the studio or posters from the CGI movie that's about to be made. And <laughs> so I get to do all the, the real world ragdolls that as they exist in Shane's actual world. Um, so that'll be fun. Awesome. Yeah. I love it. All right. You can also, uh, be in the book, get some original art from, uh, either Ben or, uh, Kevin. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, get the VIP Kevin Eastman experience. Uh, have your book, the book that you made, or I guess any book that you want. I guess I assume it can be any. Choose any book. Yeah, that's that's a really uh, cool be- goal because, like I said, there's going to be all these convention scenes, um, and so I'll be I'll be illustrating like possibly you or your property at a table in the background or maybe seated next to Shane. And so I know I have a couple of my friends who have got that reward already, and I'm you know, looking up their book and figuring out their characters and stuff like that. I'm definitely going to throw myself in there. So (laughs) of course you are. All right. Awesome, man. Awesome. All right. So uh, one more thing before we get out of here. Um, this is the point that everyone's going to stop tuning out and tune back in. So if you're, when you're at your drawing table, now's the time. Turn back, turn back, turn back. All right. And you get to deliver the thing, the piece of advice or whatever you want. These people who are listening to take away and remember leaving this podcast. So what would you like them to know? It can be a piece of advice you've imparted already, something you didn't get a chance to say so far. 
is your chance to impart one piece of 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 uh, of, uh, of of advice that these people will actually listen to if they've tuned out so far. Okay. Uh, kind of goes back to something I mentioned earlier uh, when I realized I couldn't go to art school and get that that degree that would allow me to then make comics. And it's just that if you want to make comics, you should just freaking make comics. There's so many people who are like, yeah, I'm a writer, but I haven't written anything. It's like, okay, so you're not a writer. Like, just go and figure out how to do it. And as we talked to death about, uh, Kickstarter is a great way to do that. Or you just find a way to save up enough money and survive off co- coffee and toast and, and get it done. Like, just make something. Uh, so I connect with, with the whole this whole project with Kevin so much is because that's what they did. He's like, you know, I want to make these turtle comics and I'm just going to do it. And he was drawn on his lap and working at lobster shacks here in Maine too. And, and then, you know, they did it and it blew up. So I was lucky enough to do the aggregate and then that found its way in front of Kevin. And then he called me up to do this book and it's like one thing after the next, but none of it would have happened if I didn't make that book and the aggregate wouldn't have happened if I didn't make Nathan the caveman. Like, so just do it. Like, Shut up and get to work. <laughs> awesome, man. Where can we find you online? Uh, on Instagram and Twitter. I have the same name. It's just Bish Art. So B-I-S-H-A-R-T, like Bishop and Art. And then my website is the same. It's bishart.net. Um, and if you want to go straight to the aggregate and order a copy of that, it's theaggregatebook.com. And then once again, this Drawing Blood Kickstarter is still going until the end of the month, and you can get there by going to drawingbloodcomic.com. Awesome, man. Thanks so much for coming on. Definitely. So hope you enjoyed that one with Ben Bishop. I know I did. If you did, go find Ben online and tell him thank you. If you're a writer who wants to make more money selling books, head on over to writingandsellingcommunity.com and sign up for our group for free. If you want a free first chapter of my new book, head on over to GoSellYourSoul.com. I'm releasing my new book, Sell Your Soul, How to Build Your Creative Career, next month. And now for the final thing that I want to talk about. I've been thinking about it for a long time, and we're nearing our 200th episode. Still a long way away. This is 180. 200 is 20 weeks away, which brings us right about to the beginning of the year. And I'm going to be honest with you, while I love this show, and while I love the audience for this show, it's just not growing in the way that I want it to. For instance, last year around this time, we were getting about um, 100 downloads, and uh, this year we're getting about 200 downloads, so it's almost doubled in size, but I feel like we're at least 100 times better. I feel like we should at least getting be getting a thousand downloads an episode by around this time. I've never been uh, a huge fan of the name, the business of art. Um, I've evolved the format over the years, and so I'm considering, just considering now, that two hundred episodes will be the last show I do as the business of art. 200 episodes is more than most television shows get. It's more than most podcasts get. And I feel like I've done a lot of good in the last 200 episodes. Now, if you're listening to this freaking out because you love this episode or you love this show, there's a couple of things you can do. The first to talk about the show rate it review subscribe on itunes stitcher google play that's number one number two is to tell three five of your friends who could really use the show i don't expect anyone to do that this is my thing i've been doing it for a long time i really love it but it may be time to move on. It's so maybe just a show that has such a niche audience that it's never going to catch on. I don't believe that, though. So this is what I'm going to do. 
I'm going to re- release 20 more episodes at least. I'm going to get to 200. And then, if we're getting 1,000 downloads, I will continue on. If we don't, I might continue on. Either way, I'm going to redesign something else and come back bigger, better, and stronger. I feel like 2018 is a good time for me to take a step back and think about how I want to rebrand everything. I try and come out with a big rebrand of something once a year. And this podcast is rife for rebranding into something else. Taking some of the things that I love, some of the things I didn't love so much, and trying to come up bigger, better, and stronger than before. Because now I know what I want this podcast to say, or what at least I want to say on it. I want to hear your thoughts, though. So email me, russell, R-U-S-S-E-L-L, at wannabepress.com. Tell other people, rate, review, subscribe if you want. My goal by the end of this year is 1,000 downloads a week, or 1,000 downloads an episode, which is five times more than what we have now. And 10 times more than we had at this time last year. But I have to see some growth. Some significant growth. um, For me to definitely decide to keep going. And that's on you. Partially. If you want it to be. If you're cool with this podcast going away. Cool. If you absolutely want it to stay. Tell some people about it. Tell them to download Tell them to subscribe. Show them your thing that you're doing. Show them how you subscribed, rated, and reviewed the show and what you think of it. Or don't. Either way, I'm trying to design what I'm going to do next year. And I'd love for a podcast to be part of it. I just don't know if this podcast is going to be part of it. So I'll leave you with that. I really, really appreciate you listening to me for this 180 episodes. I think we're getting stronger every week. But I'd love to know what you think. Again, that's Russell at wannabepress.com. Have a great day, wannabes and creators. I will see you next time.